Haruki Murakami is about to drop some knowledge bombs on where the source material, where the inspiration for our writing should come from. And this is one of the biggest debates in the writing community and very important for beginning and intermediate authors because if you don't follow the right path, you may get lost for years and wander aimlessly. And if you guys don't already know, my name is Ian and Write Conscious is the headquarters of everything related to Haruki Murakami here on YouTube. If you look at the playlist down below, you will see an ever blossoming library of videos on Murakami's life, his books, and his writing philosophy. And I would love to have you on this journey because here, on Right Conscious, we are creating a literary renaissance. But enough from me. Let us now hear from Murakami himself. Quote, writers who do not rely on weighty material, but instead reach inside themselves to spin their tales may, by contrast, have an easier time of it. That's because they can draw on their daily lives, the events routinely taking place around them, the scenes they witness, the people they encounter, and then freely apply their imaginations to that material to construct their own fiction. In short, they use a form of renewable energy. They feel no need to fight on the battlefield or in the bullring or to shoot lions. Please do not misunderstand. I'm not saying that direct personal involvement in things like war, bullfights, and big game hunting has no meaning. Of course it can be meaningful. Experiences are crucial for a writer of whatever kind. All I'm saying is that they needn't be of the dramatic variety to make a good novel. Even the smallest, most non-dramatic encounter can generate an astonishing amount of creative power if you do it right. There is a saying in Japanese, when trees sink and rocks float, it refers to occurrences that contravene the norm. But in the world of the novel, or perhaps more broadly in the realm of art, such reversals can take place all the time. Things the world sees as trivial can acquire weight over time, while other things broadly considered to be weighty can, quite suddenly, reveal themselves to be only hollow shells. The unending creative process cannot be perceived by the naked eye, but its power, aided by the passing of time, yields such dr drastic turnarounds on a regular basis. So if you lament that you lack the material you need to write, you are giving up way too easily. If you just shift your focus a little bit and slightly alter your way of thinking, you will discover a wealth of material lying about just waiting to be picked up and used. You only have to look. In the field of human endeavor, things that seem mundane at first glance can, if you persevere, give birth to an endless array of insights. All you need to do, as I said before, is retain your healthy writerly ambition. That is the key. And if we are going to create a literary renaissance, which requires 50,000 independent authors who are great writers, but also have the confidence to talk about their writing and share their writing with, uh, excuse me, with the world, we are going to have to transcend a lot of the small problems, all the obstacles that most writers are being blocked with right now. And I hope you already know this, but real writing comes from within. And to write consciously, to accomplish our goal, we have to engage in the ontology of phenomenology, the beingness of being. Because the reality around us in the objective world is magical. Maybe not magical as Murakami sees it, but it does have power, it does have weight. And obviously the inner worlds, the archetypal consciousness and infinite creative power within is magical. And I want to talk about really fast two different groups of people that aren't really representing this out in the world. And if you've ever been to a creative writing workshop at university or maybe with a group, there are always the people who write about their own experiences. And this is hard. I mean, this is what a lot of people do at the start of your life. And it's not wrong, excuse me, at the start of your writing career. And when I was 18 and taking a creative writing workshop at university, I got this out of my system. I wrote this story that actually happened to me about getting accidentally kidnapped at a party. Pretty crazy story. And I thought it would translate great to fiction and I spent weeks working on it. And then it fell flat in the class. And then I looked at it and I was like, no matter what I did do, excuse me, to this story, even though it, if I tell it in person to you guys, you guys will be captivated. You'll be like, oh my God, it's a great podcast or in-person story. But there were missing unconscious and symbolic elements to the story. And because I did experience it, I'd be forever blocked from being able to find that stuff. 
And this is what you see all the time in the Kindle graveyard. There are all these guys who went to war, who were firefighters or women who were abused and were part of a cult. And then they turn into this novelized piece of art. And it's 99.9% of the time garbage. And people think that they could be like Jack Kerouac because Jack Kerouac wrote On the Road in three weeks and then, excuse me, the first draft, and then wrote the final draft of On the Road in like three weeks also. But they don't realize that Jack Kerouac grew up in a very intellectual household. He went to Columbia University. He was hanging out with Gary Snyder, Allen Ginsberg. Are you hanging out with an Allen Ginsberg or a Gary Snyder daily? What university did you go to? Like, not to say that that matters, but he had a certain level of talent. He had written multiple novels before that. And most of all, he had outlined and planned on the road for the past seven years before those three week stretches of him writing the novel. And he wrote the novel and sat in one spot. His wife was just feeding him drugs, putting the reel on. He stayed in one room for those entire three weeks and got it done. So I think under those circumstances, a lot of us can do it. And when you read On the Road, it has inspired a lot of people, including myself, to go out into the world and maybe hitchhike or be a little bit more open-minded, but it could have been way better. And once again, it's kind of one of these rare occurrences and takes a certain amount of talent to be able to pull that off. And so we've kind of devolved into that because it works on Instagram, right? If you show yourself doing van life or tell your story, then it works. And it's actually melted into the traditional publishing world. For the past 10 years, the best way to get a novel published, other than like engaging in like romance or whatever, but in like the literary fiction world is to write a first person point of view from the perspective of a marginalized character in society. Nothing better than that. And if you fit the archetype of that marginalized character in reality, like if you're writing about Indian men and you're an Indian man, your chances of getting published just increase exponentially. But having read a lot of those novels, and some of them are great, but most of them were trash because the whole point of writing, the whole point of art is to be able to break free and get into different experiences and let the creative spirit, let the creative muse take you somewhere. And we've been canceled. We are not allowed to do that necessarily. I tell this story all the time, but I had a Native American literature professor. who was a nice guy, honestly, shared a lot of good information with me, but he was a part of a group of professors that canceled another professor because she was, I don't know what tribe she was, but let's say she was a Pueblo and she wrote a novel about the Lakota and she got some things wrong. And so they canceled her ass. A member of their community who was being successful, they all came together and said, we, we will never teach your books or talk about you in our classes. We won't publish you in our journals. And not because she even went against the community and went like full Kanye West or something. <laughs> Candace Owens, she didn't go Candace Owens on him. But just because she didn't get permission and talk to the elders and do the stuff. But that, that, that's what we can do. I can sit and write a novel about a 16-year-old Hopi Indian girl or Native American girl, whatever we want to talk about her. And I don't need permission from anybody. I don't need to answer to anybody. They can all go jump off a fucking cliff if they want to tell me that I can't write about what I want to write about. That's the point of the imagination. Imagination, fucking idiots. For some reason, as I was saying that, like, what are you going to write about, Ian? Whatever I feel like writing about. Gosh. Shout out Preston, Idaho. Okay, so we have the memoir writers. We have the people who just want to continuously write about their own experiences. And that stuff's okay. Like, you have your stuff and let that, use that. It's like a weapon. Time to go into a terrible right conscious analogy, but you're like on the battlefield and you're with your unit and, you know, someone's got a handgun or everyone's hopefully got a handgun. All different types of weapons. But if you went through something, that's like adding a grenade to your arsenal. It's not going to hopefully be the only thing that you use or you're going to get screwed over. Anyway, something else has happened also. This has become such a problem that there has also been a group of people, my, f my fellow, I shouldn't say fellow, sci-fi and fantasy authors who have gone off that direction too. And there have been over the past 10 years, millions, if not tens of millions of sci-fi and fantasy novels published. And unfortunately, outside of a select few people, the literary renaissance from what I can see is not going to happen through uh, science fiction and fantasy. We've been ruined, you guys. Akatar whatever the other fantasy series and sci-fi sci series that hasn't been transformational has ruined our opportunity. And there are a couple people, but in general, people are going to take you more seriously, especially if you are coming out as an independent author and saying, hey, my name is Ian Kadnak, read my work, I have something important to say. My work can transform your life. And I have a friend named Ryan, shout out Ryan. I know he watches the program and I talk about this with him all the time, but he, wrote this beautiful sci-fi novel. But a lot of it has to do with like sexual slavery 
And it does have beautiful themes about slavery and the mistreatment of women and certain types of people. And it's all like aliens. It's not even like women, but it's all kind of implied. But it's so bizarre and gruesome that me, someone who's read thousands of books and I'm pretty open-minded, the only reason I got through it is because my boy wrote it and I knew it was good, but I didn't feel the magic because it was just way too disconnected. And even though I do, I, I obviously cover in my book club, Infinite Jess, Gravity's Rainbow, 2,666, all these hard books. Most of the time, I believe that you shouldn't need a guide. You shouldn't need to jump too far to be able to comprehend a novel or a piece of poetry. You should be able to read it and like have your life transformed without having to look at Reddit, without having to do too much. If the author does a good job, Cormac McCarthy does a great job at this. You can read Blood Meridian and have your mind blown and know nothing. You could have no idea who the Comanche are or the history of Texas and Samuel Houston or anything like that and walk away a changed person. And it's unfortunate that we are here, but it's just reality. There have been so many hacks who have written in the kind of personal experience realm and then the sci-fi and fantasy realm that the air has been sucked out of the room. And so what is left? And now we can kind of return to Murakami. Well, it's the creative infinite reservoir of energy within. And my favorite thing I hear authors say, this is like actually my favorite complaint, is I can't post my stuff online. What if someone steals it? They're going to steal my ideas, steal my writing. And I'm like, first of all, no one cares about you, most likely. And two, if you are a real writer, it shouldn't matter. Because let's say you write a short story. And then someone takes the idea from that short story and makes a best-selling novel out of it. And they make millions of dollars off your idea. And you can't sue them because they disguised it perfectly. All that should show you is that you have the ability to produce good ideas. You just didn't see it all the way through. You have an infinite reservoir of creative knowledge. If one idea doesn't work, you should have 10 more in the back burner. Coming up with ideas is actually the easiest thing to do. Coming up with a novel idea is the easiest part of writing. Every fucking asshole has a novel idea, has a book idea out there. And what Murakami is talking about here is... What do you do, though, on the page, in motion, once you have the idea? If you're going to write about a cult that likes, likes uh, Ibogaine in their seltzer water at night, for the love of God, don't bring in your own psychedelic experiences and base the group off of the guys you used to do mushrooms with when you were 22 years old. And Murakami, I think, from what I can tell, is critiquing Hemingway because Hemingway, you know, was a big game hunter and relied off of all these big experiences. But I think that was more of a persona because even though a lot of his characters did do that, did do those types of things, when you look at like the Nick Adams stories, a lot of the time it was very muted experiences like Indian Camp or Big Two-Hearted River or A Way You'll Never Be. There, it's not that intense of writing. And even though it is pretty autobiographical, Hemingway is just infusing it with symbols and unconscious stuff. And depending on what you think, he wasn't doing it on purpose. It's all, it was all just getting pulled from him and all of his trauma and stuff. And that's what you, that's what can happen. If you just tap into intuition, all your problems, all your demons, it will come out on the page and you won't even know what's happening. I've learned more about my psychological oddities from what I've just been randomly writing about when I'm in the flow state, than any Jungian active imagination or meditation or anything like that. I'm like, oh shit, Ian. That wasn't supposed to get let out. But if anyone ever asks, you just defer it to a friend. You say, yeah, I have a friend that did that. That's a great thing about being a writer. You can always say it's fiction. But back to the original point, you should never be scared about people stealing your work. And that should never hold you back from posting your stuff online. And if you are scared, it's because you don't believe you have infinite creativity within you, which a lot of people don't. And a beautiful line that Murakami says is that even the smallest, most non-dramatic encounter can generate an astonishing amount of creative power if you do it right. And this is where actually having awareness, the phenomenology of ontology comes into motion. That That's why writers should be working on their inner world, on their spiritual life. Even if you're a Christian, becoming more aware, engaging in... Theosis, if you're a Christian, to, you know, take you to the higher realms of consciousness, because when you kind of start walking up the ladder of consciousness, you are more aware to the more to more of the subtle aspects of not just nature, but human interpersonal uh, relationships and what's happening within when you 
reach a mystical state, one of the one of the first things that is reflected upon or con- contrasted on is your own weaknesses, your own problems, your own blockages. And this is why that, for instance, when someone takes a psychedelic for the first time or the first couple times, they're crying about their mom. They're realizing about life and death. I should be nicer to people. Like, you know, they're not thinking, I mean, some of the time they're like, oh my God, there's aliens, but there, it's more of an exploration of kind of the blemishes of our own soul. But once you get over that, and a lot of people never do, if you can get over that, then you can start looking at and pinpointing that awareness, that consciousness on everything else. And this is what the Buddha meant by, you know, when he said, I am awake. This is what all the East, and even, you know, if you look at certain aspects of Christianity, teach, you know, having an accurate perception of reality, being able to see. And then when you do, you'll start to get a lot of the kind of riddles and aphorisms of religion about, you know, like, you know, and again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Or a lot of the more Zen Taoist stuff talking about how people who are poor and the most illiterate have the most to teach you. And that is true. But you have to understand how to listen. You have to be under, understand how to see. This is why guys like Dostoevsky and stuff were able to kind of tap into this. Even before, because even though he had to go live in a Siberian war camp and all that, he was raised in a bourgeoisie family. His father had serfs that eventually rebelled and killed him. But when you look at his first two novels, The Double and Poor Folk, he was our already tapped into the consciousness of the people. He understood, he was listening, he was seeing, he had that ability. And then obviously after the trauma of his, uh, in the middle of his life kind of, you know, gave him the ability to write his masterpieces at the end of his life, but the power was already there. And this is why I recommend that for a while, excuse me, writers should learn that part of themselves or focus on that in reality if they haven't before. If we look at Murakami's life, what was he doing before he became a writer? Well, he was running a jazz club and what was happening there? Well, as the owner, he had to have an objective, sober point of view of all the people drinking, but he was also listening to music. He was engaged in art, in entertainment every single night and did that for years and years and years. That is a beautiful training that isn't like, you know, the advice of go sit and meditate or go, you know, look at a fucking leaf all day. No. There are different, you know, it, this is your own personal journey, but it is about kind of tapping into more of that flow and artistic state, then combining that with some real, real world reality. How I personally did this is for years and to this day, I go out every single day. I've structured my life that I live out in the desert, near the desert. I can walk to an endless desert within two minutes. And I like the desert because I've lived in Oregon, Utah, Wyoming, and for eight months of the year, I can't walk outside. It, let me tell you, it's really uncomfortable to write a poem outside when it's 10 degrees outside. You can do it, but you're, it's, you're wearing a glove and writing. It's a mess. But every single day of the year, I can walk outside in the desert and write a poem. You know, right now it's going to be 105 today, but I woke up at five in the morning and got it done. And it was 79 degrees outside. But that helped me see, first of all, kind of the magical power of reality. But then I started looking at people. Then I started writing about people. I started looking back at the city. I used to live in Las Vegas. I'd be out in the desert. And if I turned one direction, I'd see the endless desert. Then if I turned the other direction, I'd see the Las Vegas Strip. Beautiful contrast, beautiful reflection. And that's what you should be doing. There should be a mystical, more endless, boundless exploration of nature or within. And then there should be something connected to reality. And all you're doing is working out those muscles, just, you know, freshening them up so that when you sit down, it all can flow out of you. And it doesn't require writing. Like I said, I was doing poetry and that's proved very useful for longer uh, fiction stuff, but you could do, I learned a lot by working at a security job in Las Vegas on the strip, met all types of people, got to sit in silence and learn to be bored. I know Shane Harrington out there who runs a band called Cinemartyrs, a fan of the show. And he told me he works at an art exhibit as his day job and just has to sit there all day and look at art and talk to people about art. But basically most of the time he's just standing in silence. And he says that that changed his life and he could find a better paying job, but he just wants to continue doing that. And Murakami also makes a great point that there are things that maybe people don't take seriously, but your creative process, your vision, your sight can make it serious. That's what art can do. Suddenly, a perspective, a group, an idea can become cool, can become a fad, or can be shown to someone, and it can feel serious. Like, for instance, in Infinite Jess, if you guys want to check out some of my new Infinite Jess shirts, you know, we only, we're reading some books that heal over here on Right Conscious. Link is down in the description below if you want some literature streetwear. But in Infinite Jess, there is this group of Quebecois terrorists. And when I think of Quebec, uh, Quebec separatism, I laugh. I'm like, I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm like, ha, ha, ha. 
But through them, through something that we feel that is silly, Wallace and Infinite Jess makes beautiful points about terrorism, entertainment, disabled people, like many different things. And it's actually serious analysis. It's serious commentary. And it's some of the best stuff in the novel. And somehow, and for some reason, he saw that their struggle, their ideas, their attitude was something important and he fixated on it, then used the creative power within to turn it into something that can transform our own life. I'm about to make a video on that very soon about some of their philosophy and it's some of the most weighty stuff David Foster Wallace ever said. But it's said by a bunch of disabled Quebecois terrorists who are in wheelchairs. Not who you expect to be, you know, giving you a personal development seminar. And this is what Murakami does with a lot of his novels, obviously. He adds more of the magical realism element to it, but a lot of things that we take for granted, he just reverses. Sometimes through just the most direct way, for instance, by making a cat talk. It's like, oh, wow, here's a cat and it talks. Like, oh, shit. That's a little bit tacky. But I'm reading 1Q84 right now with the Right Conscious Book Club. If you guys want to join and read 18Q4 with me, get access to daily office hours, daily podcasts, a bunch of other stuff. The link to that is down in the description below. I would love to see you guys over there. But at, in book number one, no spoilers here, Murakami makes a beautiful critique of the whole publishing world. He gives his ideas and does all this stuff and, and it's really great, but I, I'm immersed in the story. I don't really feel that at all. He also makes a great commentary on domestic abuse from, perspe from a perspective that I haven't seen very often. And it's surprising to see it in a Murakami novel. He also has a whole commentary on the sexual abuse of children. There's all these different things that he can explore because it, it feels like it's unconscious and it's just coming from within. And he's renewing it in a way that feels light. And Murakami says at the end, the only thing you need to do this is your writing, writerly ambition. And that's true. It's all about the burning desire. It's all about your axiom, axiomatic priming, your attitude coming into this stuff. And that's why you can be working on this every single day. I understand maybe you hate your job. You maybe don't like the relationship you're in. You don't like certain aspects of your life. Maybe you're disabled. Maybe you're all these, you know, whatever is happening to you. And I'm sorry about that, but you are in a golden opportunity right now. Maybe you can't sit down and write for five hours a day with total focus and total energy right now. I'm sorry. But what you can do is throughout the day, notice, observe, build these inner worlds, work on these inner worlds, work on your awareness. And that's the key to good writing. If you don't have that, I don't care how you can sit down for 10 hours and it ain't going to mean shit, boy. And if you feel like you've had experiences out in the world, you probably haven't. Like if you had a crazy, I have crazy stories. I bring almost none of that to my own writing. I felt everything, all my success has not come from me. It's come from the creative spirit within, with that outside, wherever, wherever we want to talk about where that comes from. It, it came from my own awareness, my own ability to listen and see things that others wouldn't notice. And so I encourage you guys to do this. This is how we start a literary renaissance. It's about your ability to notice, to care, and then to share. So I will see you on the other side. And by the other side, one day, if you accomplish your goal, you will be on this bookshelf and other booktubers bookshelves. And so I support you. I applaud you. And now I must lament you because I have to let you go. And I have to go out into the world and go teach a bunch of 16-year-olds some English. Let's go.